I. Oh, you know what? I don't have. Yeah, I'm just gonna have to wedge everything over. So I decided to record a YouTube video where I replaced the thing in my the light in my headlight because I had a headlight out. Yeah. And I was like, I thought it was gonna be really funny that like I would just like curse through I did like a regular actual tutorial, but I would just use foul language to make it funny. Yeah. Uh, and then I legitimately replaced the wrong headlight. Oh, and I was like no. equally frustrated as I was excited that I had a punchline for the video. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that sucks. Uh, all right, here I'm. I'm gonna wedge my stupid face in in here. So we we are theoretically on now, right? Uh, yes. If you are streaming on Daily Motion, then we are on DiamondClub.tv. Oh, there it is. Yeah, the the chat mod just popped up. All right. Do we have a link? DiamondClub.tv. No right. God, that's so much easier. It's a good idea. That idea turns out that's a good one. Yeah. It's amazing. Once the video goes away, I have no problem picking my nose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh... whatever <laughs> and I'll just wedge my stupid face right there the world your kids growing up in uh yeah right where this is just a thing is she talking any yet she uh she says the first vowel set or the first letter of things like if she wants to say dog she'll go duh or, you know, she says dada, mama. And uh, and when she wants to disagree, she'll say, n -n 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 -n. <laughs> there you go. We're like a family collage right now. Hey, look at yeah. that. Yeah, it's like an Apple uh, sliding <laughs> tiles iPhoto montage. <laughs> awesome. Well, this will get us through. Uh, I'll go ahead and start recording. And we'll go, like, we'll just get the first 30 or 40 minutes in. Oh, you can't do that, baby. All right. Check, 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 check. One, two. Let me hear you guys. Check, check, check. One, two, one, two. Check, check, check your baby head. All right. Awesome. Then we're recording and ready to rock. All right. I posted this. Shutting down Twitter. Pulling up my show notes. Show notes. You came prepared. Show notes. Show notes. It's a show notes of Harlem. Ready? Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and little babies, <laughs> for our audio listeners, we have a special guest. Yeah. With she, an amazing smile. Yeah. Go ahead, introduce yourself. Go yeah, ahead. <laughs> Come on, Callie. Let's uh this you gotta have better radio manners than this. You just oh, got tossed okay. to. You're just gonna let it sit? No, no. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Callie Brushwood is here, uh, as well as uh, it's Brian, right? Brian yeah. Brushwood. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm mainly just known as her handler. I sort of just, you know, I get her from gig to gig. Yeah. And Mr. Justin Robert Young. What, was that her first words as Space Elevator? Was that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, gentlemen, little girl, let's jump right into this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Today's been kind of an Correct. interesting week because our uh, patron saint of this podcast, Mr. Elon Musk, uh, you know, there was some new uh, Tesla news. They just did this cross country trip. They've actually got enough Tesla power stations from one side of the country to the next that you can drive from New York City to San Francisco, totally electric, and actually never have to pay. For fuel because if you buy a Tesla, you get to recharge it free at a Tesla charging station, which is pretty awesome. It's such a and, and I don't care if that is just like a naked gimmick for advertising, it's a good gimmick, like oh, yeah. just you know, free exactly. forever, exactly. 
Yeah. So that's uh, although kind of although that is that's part of the selling point. Like uh, apparently a friend a uh, friend of a friend tried to call and buy a Tesla and she got a quote for what it was going to cost. She's like, oh wow, that's like that's kind of halfway reasonable. Like I mean, it's more expensive, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about it. And then uh, she actually went to the dealership and they kind of threw down the fact that that number that they'll quote you is the lifetime of the car without buying gas. That's yeah. like they, they subtract what you would normally spend on your oh, vehicle. Oh, so wait, so the number is, they don't give you the actual amount you're going to hand over in cash. You go to the well, website. No, I mean, they, 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 do, not, they do when they don't. ask you, but that, it's part of the sales, part of, part of the, yeah. the, the pitch. Go to the website, they legit. have a calculator. <laughs> Disclosure, I am a Tesla investor. Um Anyhow, I bought I bought some Tesla stock. I saw that uh, like they they freaked like I never buy individual stocks, but I'm such a, a fan. As I figured, what the heck? Like they, it took a dip. Sure. Like the first time somebody t took a cell phone camera of of one of them catching fire, and everyone's all like, "Ah, oh, cars can apparently catch fire!" and freaked out. And the it's the human torch of cars. <laughs> yes. it's a great. Exactly. It was a great time. You know, buy at that point. Uh, me, I just. Did it on the IPO because I had confidence in Mr. Musk. Well, you you were um, right to do so. But uh, anyhow, up. I digress. What I'm here to talk about, gentlemen, is Mr. Musk had some conversations and was out there talking to the media and the subject of, I guess he's involved in space somehow. <laughs> yeah, SpaceX. Yeah, he's long oh, yes, about the SpaceX. Mm -hmm. uh, well, as we've covered ad nauseum on this podcast before, SpaceX is pretty amazing. And, and Musk had talked about the goal of eventually i'll use the term uh occupying mars although conquering yeah. mars or colonizing mars oh, like conquering mars, mars. Oh. sure i i excitedly sent a uh, a news article to brian and justin because in an interview musk had talked about his optimism and spacex has been doing pretty well they've just did you know they did a a really like a high altitude like a geostationary orbit launch which is like really really tricky but they managed to pull that off they've got another launch coming up they're bustling along with the space launches, the technology, they keep iterating and improving, and this has caused Musk to feel a bit, uh, how should I say, uh, enthusiastic about the prospects of space travel to the point that he's thinking that more optimistically than before that we could be looking at a Mars colonization mission based on, I presume, SpaceX technology uh, and more near term than we had expected. Um, not 50 years, not 40 years, not 30 years. He says it would be feasible potentially to start a Mars colony mission within the next 10 to 12 years. 10 to 12 oh, years. Oh, like, like I'm that's, 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 that's like within that's the realm of realm my kids going to college and then we're going to freaking Mars. Mars. Yes, exactly. Mars college. I'm just really sad we stopped dreaming. Yes. <laughs> you know, because so, imagine what kind of crazy plans we would have if, if, we, if we hadn't stopped dreaming. We would be talking about going to Mars within, oh, wait, we're talking about that. Yeah. yeah look at that. And he says to make this feasible, you would need really, really large rockets, yeah, much like larger than the Apollo systems. He's talked about, there's been alluded to a, a rocket system called the M. CT, which is a big, super heavy lift rocket. You know, they keep testing the, the reusable grasshopper platform, which if that becomes feasible, that means the cost goes down dramatically. And the MCT, by the way, you know, they've talked about, well, we've got this MCT we're developing, which is just a big, giant rocket. And what does the MCT stand for? Master Control Terminal. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, Missy Carlton Taylor. <laughs> My yes. old teacher. Yes. Oh, it's well, that got was it. a mystery in the forums, and then somebody came out right and said, "Oh, it stands for Mars Colonial Transport." Oh my oh, God, that's oh. so amazing! Like, like, <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, here's the thing. Yes, we, you know, we're all aware that 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 there may be terrible missteps, and that maybe they won't hit the number or whatever. But to me, the prize is that right now people are saying that with a straight face face. Like that's, that's a real genuinely awesome thing or that happens. Like, just there, this there, there's a really boring piece of data database software in SpaceX that just lists things that they own. Right. <laughs> and on that next to like some, some flange or widget is, you know, <laughs> components for MCT. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is a, you know, we always hear people bemoaning, about the the fact that NASA's not doing it or whatever, and we we've talked about that before. Did did I see another story 
right where where they said like right now they're they're planning on funding you know three different private space uh, in in ways to deliver payloads, but now they're talking about dropping it to just one and a half. Yeah, we'll get in just just a second, but I want to give people just a sense of scale. What does ten years mean in a technological point of view? Okay, ten years ago, Facebook launched. Wow. 10 years, it, uh, we're creeping up on 10 years of the iPhone, huh? We're all, what, seven, eight years already? Yeah, uh, it was 2007, so yeah, seven years. But yeah, so I mean, you look at how rapidly these things change and become the norm. I mean, space, Facebook, Facebook, space, <laughs> Facebook, <laughs> I'll be all right, hold on. Facebook, it, it's, it's been around, but it still feels kind of new. It's still a newish company, yet, you know, what could be 10 years can go by like that. Ten years ago, we were in the midst, the thick of freaking out because uh, Janet Jackson's nipple was on uh, the television. <laughs> that was that was ten years ago. Yeah, we were. If they you were had a friend who hearings. had a high def television. You could zoom in real close and see that nip. I'm I'm still not over that. To be honest with you guys, <laughs> you um, traumatized. Yeah, but I mean that's ten years, and again, that's a very optimistic. You know, estimate, but that the idea that a the the preeminent engineer of our day, the Edison of our day, the Tesla of our day, the Henry Ford of our day, whatever of our day you want to call it, is saying, you know, a guy who is an extremely rational guy who is launching rockets right now, putting stuff in orbit, building electrical cars, viable electric cars, is saying, yeah, I think in 10 years we could actually start a mission to Mars. Well, and, to and keep in there. mind, you know, starting, uh, my, like, let's say, let's say that they get the reusable platform working. And, and this is the part that, that confused me was, I mean, do you really need a rocket that big? Because if, uh, and by, which rocket is using the grasshopper system right now? It'll be eventually built into all of them. Okay, so so if that's the case, then it just seems like you just make a whole bunch of little ch uh, trips and you assemble a spaceship, you know, Enterprise style out in orbit and then send it off, right? Couldn't you do that? Well, um, the, the more efficient way is you basically you launch from Earth and you continue your burn and you go into uh, a Martian trajectory rather than try to build something in orbit if you have that. And the bigger the rocket you have, the more cheaper it becomes because you have you take advantage of all these sort of advantages, you know, because your hardware, you know, if you scale your rocket, you increase your rocket engine, you know, by 30 percent, you create you can carry twice the payload or something to that effect. So it is it is a matter of, you know, it's more efficient to fly 727s across country than Cessnas. All right. Well, yeah. let's and uh, maybe we can we can dovetail into the, the topic that Brian was talking about yes. through this. Is this feasible if they are not getting government funding for, uh, for, for missions between here and there? Is 10 years optimistic if uh, the government says that we are not going, for whatever reason, we don't really want this awesome cheap space travel uh, that we have, or, yeah, or, or uh, they, they, yeah, they're foster. just, or if they just say the contract is going to someone else, you know, like like uh, we're we're gonna do all Soyuz because we got them laying around. I think that I think that there's probably in the in the uh, SpaceX spreadsheet there's several contingencies. There, you know, when it comes to getting launches, like getting paid for to, you know for doing commercial launches, the Russians and the Chinese, you know, do a lot of that and. Right now, the SpaceX is getting a lot of corporate customers, and there are enough people with big pockets excited about it that I certainly think that you know there's a tremendous amount of potential. Worst case scenario, Elon Musk says, "I'm going to go IPO this, and I'm going to do." But here are the conditions that you can't. You know, we're going to Mars, whatever, and you know you got to let us do as we please. You know, shareholders have to understand that. Uh, I think you know this is he could raise any amount of money that he would need, and I, I don't think at this point, having proven the technology, having proven that they can do this, it would be it would be a, a setback to a degree. But I think that they were always trying to make sure that they were not a military a industrial contractor. Yeah, to the government, beholden to completely. And I think that it's it, it's certainly having NASA fund things like the crew development things, and that gets into a problem we have now is. Uh, the problem that uh, Virgin Galactic is having 
is they want to do these missions into like you know low you know just take you into you know the upper orbital space, you know, tech edge of space. The problem is, is they want to be able to continuously improve their rocket systems, but under FAA regulations, you can't modify your craft after you've been certified for it. And then to go through the recertification process could take years, and they're looking at this problem like, okay, if we notice that we can get a slightly more efficiency, make it slightly more safer, we ground it. We can't, do we ground our fleet for two years and wait for FAA to approve this? And you know, we're in a position where government's not really ready for how fast these things iterate. Well, and that's the other thing is uh, in the article that I had run across, the the idea was that NASA, instead of funding three, they would do one and a half basically. And the idea is that it would foster, you know, kind of kind of a cutthroat competition between them, which theoretically would scoot things along. But the problem is is that uh, number one, it it introduces some. Uh, I don't know, unreliability, some some mm-hmm. chaos. You know, if you're trying to make a plan and you don't know if you're going to sink billions of dollars into something and have nothing to show for it, it makes it harder to risk that money. But also, there's a culture difference in the get it done SpaceX kind of ethos versus the no, seriously, stop everything. Every screw must be certified. Lives are at stake and we got to cover our butt NASA type thing. Yeah, it, there is a, you know, there's you know the the problem that NASA has, and NASA's got some of the most bright, talented, and ambitious people in the world. Is that you're inside of a bureaucracy that belongs to the people, and you know, obviously there's the political side. You're beholden to a few politicians who decide your funding, pork barrel politics, and then internal stuff, and then the idea that like oh we can't have any risk at all, and that becomes you know it's a lovely notion, and then the the way in which they try to make that the case doesn't really work out. You can say that on paper, you know, you know, let's have zero risk or whatever. And there are the processes we'll have to prevent that. And we've had two shuttle disasters. So, yeah. Well, and that's, that's, let let me, let me, let me ask you a question. We are uh, in, in the, in the nascent stages of a presidential race. If Elon Musk, we are two years away from it. If Elon Musk is saying 10 years to a, uh, to a Mars shuttle launch. That means that somebody that got elected during this next presidential cycle, should they go two terms, would bring them right up to the edge of that window. Mm-hmm. Is this something that could enter the national stage of consciousness in in a uh, for or against kind of way in, in, in the presidential race? Aside given, from in my head, if I was... Given how a well bit. Newt Gingrich's uh, bold... You know, endorsement of space and well, exactly. exploration and, and, and his but campaign. Like, are are we on the edge of that? Like, is is there a point where, like, we'll look back at the fact that Newt Gingrich brings a lot of Newt Gingrich baggage and a lot of I talk about whatever kind of baggage to, to bring that up? But could a level-headed, popular candidate bring something up like that and bring Elon Musk on stage and say, "I am for this. I want this," and not be laughed out of the national consciousness? Well, and you realize the real question here is: Could we see in a presidential? Can we see a presidential e- debate? essentially devolve into a weird thing style argument like 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 an actual <laughs> argument from our show suddenly shows up like you can't do a one way trip to mars it's crazy <laughs> that would be amazing uh, i would love uh, i i you know the, the, the thing to me it was sort of amusing the people who are complaining we stopped dreaming were some of the ones who were the most vocal critics of newt Gingrich's, you know yeah. excitement about the moon you know i thought that was like well you know here, here's Here's a politician who, maybe on a bunch of other issues, you know, there's another discussion there. But when it comes to space and stuff, is is the most enthusiastic guy we've seen. And it's like, you know, we're going to make fun of him for that. Man, it's so weird because you're using the words, some people or people who say, but I feel like you're only talking about one person, <laughs> whoever that person may be. <laughs> well, there was everybody who tweeted it. Okay, those people, all all those. Okay, that's fair enough. Everybody. I'm so confused here. Yeah, uh, you, you, you had a bit of a Skype hiccup, but we we were able to hear everything. Hopefully, you didn't lose too much of us. No, I just missed what you were talking about. The some people. Oh, uh, I was pointing out that like you're saying that uh, you were using the plural of these people, but I I was thinking that it was only one person, and I was being coy about who that one person might be. No, I mean, it was like an SNL skit and anything else about, 
Oh, really? Oh, all right, all right. Oh, yeah, no, oh about, my God. About Gingrich. Yeah. No, 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 not, not Gingrich. I'm talking about uh, you're saying the We Stop Dreaming. So stuff. Neil deGrasse Tyson oh. had the big We Stop Dreaming <laughs> thing. He got edited into a thing. Everybody retweeted it. It was a big mass movement of NASA nostalgia that we stopped dreaming because we're not funding all these other projects. It was, a, it was, it was a, certainly a movement. It was a lot of people. And a lot of those same people were also very, very critical of, of Newt Gingrich, for which I think, listen, if you want to be critical about Newt Gingrich, be critical about Newt Gingrich, man. There's a lot of stuff to be critical about that dude about. Like, I'm not, I'm not caping up for Newt. I'm just he, saying that, he's like, kind of crazy. I'm, yeah, I, I'm just saying that I would like for this to be in the national consciousness. I would like for us to have a a national robust debate about it, largely because I think the the stuff that we talk about here is on the right side of history. You know, like that we we want, and I think the public wants to know that we could be a multi-planet species within our lifetime. That's a really, really rad idea. Like, you know, the, there's something very central to human nature about being the ones that were there when it happened, you know? And this is like, when you think about, man, what would it have been like to be alive when, you know, continents were being discovered or kingdoms were being uh, set up and, and falling within a lifetime like that? This could be that in a grand yeah. scale. And I think that, you know, it's interesting is that, like, the idea of the exploration of space being a good thing is, you know, not owned by any particular party. You know, both parties have either at different times fully supported that or have said, you know, let's not, you know, be as ambitious about that. And so it kind of doesn't know any political ideology, which is what I kind of love about the notion. Sure. Although I'd love to see somebody... Somebody get real aggressive about it. I'd love to see somebody just high five an Elon Musk saying, when I'm president, uh, this whole Mars thing, man, like, let's roll. Yeah. Gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah. I may say that. So there's a uh, really fascinating article came out a couple days ago, a, a study. And it's one of those things I read this and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. This this is this is really exciting, and the ramifications of this are incredible. And then I try reading everything I can on it, and I can't find anything to say that yes, it could be used for this really cool application. Uh, Japanese researcher has said that they have been able to do teleport energy. I'm sorry, it sounded like you said teleport. Sounds yes. like you dropped the T word there. Teleport. All right. Now tell, tell, what does that mean like, to teleport? Like, like, like Bamf? Like, you know, yes. like, like Nightcrawler teleport? Well, okay. But is this, is this uh, teleport energy? Like, is this faster than light or I guess as no. fast as light or? A quantum, same sort of quantum kind of thing. The, the, the state changes, whatever. And if any, there's any information change, then it would be speed of light, what have you. But the, so I read this and I'm like, okay, I've got, you know, my little cesium atoms or whatever they're using here. And I got my thing here and I, I put energy into this system there and I get energy out of that system over there. Right. Yeah. Now does that, that so I read that I'm like, okay. Cause then what's really cool is like, I'm thinking like you have a rocket ship. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you build your power plant, you know, in orbit somewhere and you collect all that energy and you just teleport it to the rocket. And if you want to get to relativistic speeds, well, guess what? You can do that now because you don't have to carry all that mass that's accelerating you. So, well, tell me this: Does uh, can you encode information in the energy? Like, uh, like is this not only a way to transport, uh, you know, a lot of important energy, but also, also, basically have a kind of an Ansible type thing? It's, it's not. Wouldn't you would not be able to send information faster than light? It's it's, it's so it's, okay. it's using the same experiments we use to send information. Got it, got it, got it. But 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 actual energy as well. You know that was one of the things that uh, that I man must have been like in the early '90s or whatever. There was talk about creating a giant solar array uh, hovering over the planet and then taking all that energy and beaming it down as microwave energy, which just sounded like a real sensible way to do it. Until I realized that essentially they were describing a death ray. To, yes. to, to put up in, in the sky. Yeah, and and it's a, and also yeah, that was it's an exciting kind of idea. But then if you look at like where solar efficiencies are getting to, the amount of energy you save by collecting up there 
and then you still have to transmit it down and all that. You're just better off building, you know, your plants on Earth, um, you know, if you're living on Earth. But if you're out there. But yeah, but this really you look at you go, OK, this is cool. So I'm, I keep I'm hoping somebody really smart is hearing this and understands the paper. It can tell us like, oh, yeah, no, you could you could put energy into what one part of the system and have it go through the other part and extract it from there because that would revolutionize things like the potential for space travel because you have a, have a you could have a spacecraft that could use light propulsion or whatever and you do not have to carry your mass of energy whatever is providing it on board which so, would mean you could have something go you could build a rocket that goes almost the speed of light that's so amazing where it's like, because that's that's the reason that 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 it the the problem, of course, the closer the speed of light you get, the more exponentially uh, the costs are in terms of energy, right? That's the big slowdown yeah. there. Yeah, you need. Yeah, exactly. You you have this curve, and it takes more energy to get closer towards there. I have uh, there was uh, speaking of like energy. I'm trying to find the exact article. There was something I ran across that uh, talked about a a entire type of uh plant that um uh let's see nope that's not there it's a type of plant that thrives in desert conditions living on salt water so all of a sudden you uh, it would it would uh, that that has serious biofuel potential so basically take all this unused uh and maybe you can help me find the article i'm sure it's on like news.google.com somewhere uh, but uh, but the idea was uh, it was Boeing because one of the problems is that Boeing is right now they're they're like on track right now. We're looking at the energy futures and it's all going to be shale and tar sand, which is not as good a quality of aeronautics kerosene as we would like. We would rather see, uh, you know, given the type of equipment that we have, we don't want to have to retool our, our equipment to use crappy fuel. We'd rather have higher end biofuels. So we're investigating ways to do that. And uh, and they they found this out. I'm gonna see if I can find the article, but uh, uh, that is uh, very exciting to me. I, sh I yeah, I'm just my mind's still back on this whole teleporting energy thing because like <laughs> like like teleporting energy across any distance. Well, and so I, I wish I knew, like uh, have they have they talked about like how much energy or if there's an upper bound to it or a distance. I I, I think you know like all these things it comes up to a matter of scale but if you have this thing in principle and theory the idea that you can put energy into one system have it show up somewhere else without any loss because it essentially teleports from one point to the other you know you build your 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 starship and you don't have to put your fuel on board it just has just, to stay quantum entangled with hq at all times yeah which means that hq can be plugged into you know a humongous fusion reactor or you know a, a million cubic feet of solar panels aimed at the sun and continuously have this energy propelled sent to your system that can continually accelerate. So, all right. Um, can we, can we get it in bite size for the, for the dummies here? I'm going to be king of the so, dummies. Um, yes. and, and like, so, let's, let's, let's lay it out if it were in a room. Right. I mean, I like, like I know that the, the, a starship is kind of the, the, yes. the outer end of it, but like, like explain it in, in basic concept. Okay. So imagine you had a car. Okay. Now, if you push the car, it's going to get stopped by friction, wind resistance, and then the friction against the surface that it's on. Okay. We put that car in space. We give it a little bit of a kick. It's going to keep accelerating at the same speed at which we kicked it. Right. If you can have a little motor on there that, you know, shoots off a little, you know, something that gives it a little propulsion. It could be an ion. It could be even be photons or whatever that makes it, gives it a little bit of a push. It's going to go faster and faster and faster, right? Now, the problem is, is if your car has your fuel tank and has to carry all that fuel, you're trying to move that massive amount of fuel. And once you're out of fuel, you're not going to accelerate any faster, right? Yeah. If you didn't have that fuel tank, if you could just teleport your fuel into the tank, one, that car could go any distance you want it to. And two, because you don't have to deal with friction or anything else, every time you turn on that motor, it's going to go a little bit faster and a little bit faster and a little bit faster. And in a very short amount of time, instead of having to carry, you know, 9,000 gallons of fuel to, you know, 500 pounds a car, you just have your 500 pounds a car, you're going to be going close to the speed of light, you know, in a matter of 
days or weeks. So is this we, is this space dependent or or could it happen like, you know, could could it be a car thing where I just buy my fuel by subscription and we run Yeah. But there there are ways at which you could transmit like I mean there are other ways which you could make that system work like you look at induction pads and things like that and we can transmit energy in a terrestrial way meters and probably hundreds of meters and things like that we'll see something like that of you know probably at some point yeah and you know that's one of the things that you know Tesla experimented with is the idea of being able to power things remotely so that idea is kind of the idea to go hundreds of yeah you know miles thousands of miles millions of miles to transmit energy means that if you want to go to Mars, you're looking at, you know, you're, you're talking Mars in days. If you want to go to Alpha Centauri, if you want to go to our nearest star, like 3.4 light years or whatever, I, I don't know the distance, whatever, you're talking a 3.4 year, 3.5 year trip. And for you on board that, it's going to feel like, you know, a week. It opens up the galaxy. Now, no, all right. So you read this, and this is where your mind went, but you're not sure whether or not the the thing really means that, and we need smart people to tell us because tell us, if yes. I'm the king of the dummies, you are uh, uh, you are layers above, but not too far away because there's more smart people. Still, still a dummy. <laughs> I'm still there, and so that's what I'm trying to understand. Is like, does this mean that we can put, we can just keep pushing energy into the system from point A and keep pulling it out of point B? Man, I, I. I, I I hate being dumb uh, because it's like I, I can't I can't even wrap my mind around the limitations of it. Like I, I want to say that in one of the books I read recently, like the the upper limits of doing uh, quantum entanglement stuff was that it required a lot of exotic matter that that's very difficult to harvest, you know, like, uh, um, you know, science. <laughs> I mean, it's just I don't know. There's like just... like like unobtainium. Yeah, no, or, I mean, that, or, that's know. like for like wormholes. But we can do some of these examples on like tabletop stuff like that. And you know, we're you know, you take things like you know antimatter. You know, there is a Moore's law to that where we every every you know like three years or two years or something we double the amount of antimatter we can produce. And we're looking at within 30 years time, antimatter is going to be a practical fuel source for certain kinds of space travel. That is Following amazing. what's been going on before, assuming no radical breakthroughs, but the same persistent incremental ones. With quantum stuff, you know, we can transmit information using these, these little quantum things across the tabletop. And assuming that it follows that we're not violating the thing is we're not violating the law of physics. There's no law of violation law of physics. You're putting information into a system. We're getting it out of the system. We put an energy in. We're getting it out. You just can't make it go faster than the speed of light. But assuming that, you know, that's the other thing too is if you have that much energy and and you and the ability to do that kind of crazy acceleration, one of our biggest problems with space travel is uh, zero gravity bone density lost, and that's mm -hmm. why that's why we we have people exercise and strap themselves down to run on treadmills so it jostles the bones in ways that, that keeps them strong. If you could do that, you could accelerate at one G and have essentially like that star starship enterprise experience of you're just walking around like it's any other place. You spend half the trip accelerating at one G, the other half of the trip decelerating at one G, and you end sure. right there. But but the thing is, is too, is that remember, like at the speeds you would be capable of going, the relativistic speeds, your trip would be for your time for the person on board the ship would be really short. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess the question is uh, at what like how fast can you accelerate before you start damaging the body? Like, would you, would you accelerate at two G? Can you, can you live all day at two G or can you, can you live all day at three G? Because, you know, we do it for a short amount of time during, during rocket. And what about takeoff. LTE? Yeah. In answer to that, uh, Jaime, AKA tensor guy, uh, <laughs> we're, we're hoping you'll answer this for us. Yeah. I would imagine, I would, imagine, I would uh, yeah, I would imagine that based on the nature of the mission, and I wonder how fast you would get to relativistic speeds at accelerating at 1G. This is all great. We should get a scientist on this show sometime. <laughs> I, I mean, I can look at it and I can go, well, as a writer, this is interesting because this doesn't violate the law of physics and we can do X. And as somebody with any sort of practical knowledge of how the world works, I have no clue. 
And welcome to the Charm of the Weird Things podcast. You know, uh, so, speaking of which, I had another question that that uh, that I, I wanted to ask our friend of the show, uh, Dr. Paul Zak, you know, who, who wrote uh, The Moral Molecule and is an expert in oxytocin. And, uh, of course, oxytocin causes you to, to be more fair in business negotiations. And they have ultimatum games where people on oxytocin were more generous with their money. Um, but I was wondering, and, you know, one of the things he says in the book is that you can induce a flood of oxytocin just by hugging someone. And so, you know, that's one thing he'll do. He'll announce so it's not weird, like, hey, I'm going to give you a hug just so you know it's coming. And then, and then you know, it, it, it affects the way people react. Uh, it was the weirdest thing. When we went skiing with Bonnie and I, she was uh, having a hard time really being aggressive on, on this hill until she started cursing. And it was the weirdest thing. Like, just the act of cursing just sort of got her in this punk rock mindset where she just attacked it. And I wonder if if there's any experiments about whether you can induce testosterone by by cursing or, if, or listening to certain kinds of music or whatever. I figured if, if any of you guys get the chance to... To talk to, to Dr. Zach, let him know that that's what I want yeah, to know. Yeah, that's a great question. Like, I wonder maybe just adrenaline, you know, that yeah. that, that might be. Um, you know, engage that fight or flight response. That's that's a very good question. So, yeah, uh, your wife's a foul-mouthed woman. Okay. Well, we, right. when, it, when it suits her. and <laughs> When the kids, I guess, I think it took like uh, 48 hours for the effect to wear off of, of constantly being around kids and on good behavior. And it's like, it didn't Virtual matter. Way. <laughs> uh Want to do one more space thing that's kind of cool and awesome? Yeah, I think we got like nine more minutes. So uh, the Dwarf Planet series, um, which is, uh, you know, out there hanging around, biggest asteroid in the solar system. They're using the uh, European Space Agency Herschel Space Observatory, and they're looking at it. And what do they see coming off a of series? Uh, I would I would think just like... Uh like coming off, I would imagine like uh, you get a, you get a lot of of uh, Some ice. vapor. Was it vapor? vapor? Yeah, it's vapor, water vapor, shooting out little streams of water vapor. Because I guess it sublimates in the in the in the face of the sun's heat. Well, Brian, um, apparently you should tell these scientists because they still don't know what oh. does. <laughs> All of that's actually breaking news. That's actually probably the prevailing theory. So. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's uh, it may be volcanism, you know, that hot material interior is being spit out, that there could be, you know, something going on interior that could still be kind of warm inside there and it's heating up water and it's shooting out. So, you know, Ceres has often played an important part in a lot of sci fi stories because if we want to go colonize something that's not as big as a full planet, you go there. And guess what, folk? We got water. Yeah, so that's that's well, interesting. And that and that's and we've talked about this before, where it's like, uh, correct me if I'm misstating your your position, Andrew, but like you seem to feel like the whole terraform colonize Mars is a bit of a red herring. Like like w when we start colonizing, it's going to be in asteroids because we we could dig in. There's plenty of space, and and you're shielded from the sun and cosmic rays. Yeah, I think long before we have a breathable atmosphere on Mars, we're going to be happily living on inside and in. Orbital habitats and planetoids and other places. Just, just the given the, the given time that it'd take to turn. And I think not to say I'm against terraforming Mars. I'm like, let's do it. But I just think they'll have more people will be living, you know, on these rocks and other places, you know, and spread out throughout the, you know, there there'll be a point where more people will live on artificial habitats than will actually live on planets. God, say that. Say those words again. That's so mind blowing. I think there will be a point when more people <laughs> live in artificial habitats and asteroids than actually, actually live on planets. I, I, I like that you did, though. <laughs> and that's not a novel idea. You know, I've been rereading uh, The Player of Games, which uh, Ian Banks, I think, was my pick the other week. And that's one of the things he talks about, the character there. You know, they live on these, these, you know, these big, huge, flat sort of planet-type surfaces. And most people in this future singularity-esque type civilization live on those and very few people live on planets and he's talking to somebody and she's been describing volcanoes to him. And he's like, wow, those sound very unpleasant because, <laughs> you know, they wouldn't have volcanoes on these big, huge, you know, flat artificial gravity systems or whatever controlled by, you know, robots. I don't know. You know, and I wonder too, here's the, every time I visit Manhattan, I just think of it as an arc as, as a spaceship. Like this is, uh, uh, in fact, there was some proposal around the turn of the century. Like if we did need to get to, another star system you could build a three mile arc with uh with a sustainable 
whatever inside. It would be roughly the the size and shape of Manhattan. And uh, I'll tell you what, man, Manhattan kind of has it figured out. Like you, when you once you put your mind in that space, you can pretty much picture this is what it'd be like to live on an ark. The exception being, though, of course, that uh, you would have only you know one percent of the living space you have on Manhattan because everything, food, resources, all that is brought in. Sure, it's not exactly what we'd call self sustaining. Um, but 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 it's but it's roughly an analog as far as how cramped an existence you could mm-hmm. live with because sure, you know sure. you, you picture. You know, oh, go ahead. Yeah, see, so the thing we think about too is that like. Uh, you know, I live out here. I'm, I'm right now I'm in L.A., but I also live back in Florida. And where I live in Florida was an inhospitable place because of malaria, because of swamp, because of all that. We terraformed that, you know, Manhattan. If you look at the original outline of Manhattan versus what it was before and what it was now in the 19th century, they were extending the surface area of Manhattan by just throwing their garbage and just dumping stuff out there. And expanding it when they were digging, you know, the the new location for the new uh, the Freedom Tower, they found what looked like the remnants of a ship, you know, because wow. yeah. you know the, the stuff that they built. And so we've been, you know, the the Dutch have been doing this forever. The Japanese have been doing this. And you look at you look up Google Earth, look at Dubai, and there are people the most luxurious place in the world to live right now. It was ocean. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the favorite crazy game is watching them sculpt all these, you know, super high dollar like you could live on islands that are analogs to the the world or they've got, uh, you know, this this islands that are all carved out to look like a palm tree or whatever. Freaking Dubai, man. That's crazy. Crazy. Dubai now. <laughs> you want luxury. We ready to jump Call into picks? Dubai. Yeah, man, let's do picks. Uh, I'll right. go first. Yeah, uh, and actually, right here, I'm going to stop it down, and we'll we'll do the rest of it after this other interview because I got to be live on there. Um, I I think they were. I I don't know how long it'll be, but you said your heart out was at what time, Andrew? Two thirty. Okay, so four thirty ish. Thirty. Dude, you want to? I mean, like, you, you guys don't just want to like just. I mean, because I don't have a really long pick. Like, I don't know if you guys have things that you want to go on a monologue about, but like. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I've uh, I've got this other interview in five five minutes, but uh, I'll I'll do mine right now. I'm reading Steven Pinker's How the Mind Works, uh, which I believe was was done back in the '90s. Uh, some of the references feel a little bit dated, and it's it's a bit heavier than I had expected because I really enjoyed Better Angels of Our Nature, but this man, it definitely uh, definitely is is very precise and tedious. He talks about all the different uh, theoretical processes that that your brain uses the different demons that, uh, that are simple constructs that you can have a simple and, you know, simple neuron, just figure out X, Y, Z. It's, I don't know. I, it's mostly over my head, but I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Cool. I'll do my pick. Uh, I, it is a qualified pick and it, it is a, I would say that arguably that everybody involved with this would tell you that this movie was not without its complications and didn't quite deliver at the box office the way anybody hoped. But for some reason, I've watched it twice now, and that's Ender's Game. And, you know, if you've read the books, you know, we can get into, oh, the book's this. But I think that they tried to adapt some of the important concepts of the book into the movie. But the problem is the book should be, you know, a six-hour miniseries or something. There's just so much story in there, it's hard to fit it into a film, I think, without giving up on a lot of things. And they tried not to let go, which I think is one of the problems of it. But I still, it's clunky. It's very, very clunky. Uh, I could I could nitpick the thing for a long time, but I watched it and I said, I'm going to watch it again. And there are parts that I really enjoyed how they portrayed the zero G, you know, battle simulations and other things into it. So if you like space stuff, I say you should see it. <laughs> That's uh, the ringing I'll, endorsement. I'll you, I got to I got to watch it. But just from the trailers, I think I'm at the point where I'm worried about Harrison Ford being in the new Star Wars movies. Oh, just because like, he looks like he's phoning everything in and just doesn't I think care. We've, I think we've reached the point of diminishing returns on Harrison Ford as an actor, but that's that, that that's a whole other topic on weird things. Speaking of the point of diminishing returns, I started watching Sherlock, and uh, I it's Sherlock because it's great to see those guys be Sherlock and Watson. But man, I'm 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 up. I watched the first two episodes last night, and I liked the first one. I really did not like the second one, and I hope the third one kind of redeems it. But uh, are you talking it's about still good? It's of, still it's so good to watch. But whew, you're talking about of the most the recent season. season. Yeah, this oh. is the most recent season. Okay, yeah, just it. aired on PBS. Yeah, 
Yeah, uh, you know, I, I I thought the third was the best of the bunch, um, but the but the first one, man, they took an awful lot of like, isn't it just adorable how flummoxed he is, you know? Yeah, and that second one, seventy five percent of the thing are just like, oh wow, really? We're just telling Shaggy Dog stories that what we're doing? Is that like <laughs> these guys have movie careers? They should be hobbits and dragons, man. We we got them back here to London for this. This is what we're doing. <laughs> All right, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. All right. Whoa. Something switched. I think we hear a different uh, a different sound now. You all right? Yeah, I think it's on your end. That's weird. All right. It's been weird. Yeah. <laughs> and abbreviated. Yeah, I don't know Good. why. That was like a punk rock weird things. Yeah, man. Got in, got out. Man, your audio just went really extreme. Did something change on your end, Justin? No. Well, now, now it went back down. That's really weird. It, it got like all blown out there for a second. No, I think it's the Skype thing. Okay. Um, awesome. Hey, uh, thanks thanks for doing a shorter episode this week, uh, guys. I'm, I'm sorry I got to jump over to do this radio interview now. Um but I will check you guys later on. Adios. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.